One last reminder that this week, January 26th, this Friday, my band, Lorenzo's Music, will be playing at The Frequency along with Boo Bradley and Negative Example. So I hope to see you there on Friday, January 26th at The Frequency. You can check out our music at lorenzosmusic.com. Now here's the show. I'm Tom Ray, and this is American Bandito. It's one thing to have a dream to pursue what you love full time. It's another to have the guts or the ability to take a risk to actually give it a try. Now, if you've been listening to the show, you know that I've been talking with 10 local shops and galleries here in Madison, Wisconsin about how they did it. The past two episodes, I found out that for the most part, doing what they love full time was never a question. It was a choice to make. And they all in one way or another just did that, made the choice. So that should be it, right? End of story. Do what you love, live happily ever after, done. Of course not, none of us really think that. And it must be hard not to think that you've made the wrong choice sometimes. At least that's the thought that keeps popping into my head during this whole thing. So this raised the question I wanted to ask them about this week. How long did you give yourself to succeed? I guess I just wanted to know when hearing about the leap that they all took, did they have an exit plan just in case? Or should there be a timeline and a goal in place to prove that what you've done was successful or that you're even doing it right? First, Mia from Stone Fence told me that there actually is a standard rule in theory for giving this a go. There is kind of a rule of thumb three-year mark, like 90% of new businesses fail in the first three years. So I was like, if I can just get past that third year, okay. and so here I am going into, this will be 10, I think. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah, it has been that long, yeah. hasn't it? Now for the Yellow Rose Gallery, I asked Micah if they had a timeline for the nonprofit setup that he had created. I wanted to know what kind of deadline there is to consider that a successful move was made into a nonprofit. We've already like created our place in the community as a for-profit, right? So moving into a nonprofit didn't really change anything in terms of our profitability. We've always been solvent, so we've always been successful. I think we're trying to grow a lot faster than, than we used to. We've got a strategy in place and a mission now. Since the time that I recorded my interview with the Yellow Rose Gallery, their timeline was actually kind of chosen for them. It was announced that the building that they are in has been sold and it's being demolished, I believe. I recently reached out to Demetrius and he says they have plans to relocate, but when I saw him at the final gallery night party that they had, he said that they don't have a place yet. I hope that they do find one because I think this gallery has been very helpful to a lot of artists out there. Sarah from 11000 isn't even a year into opening her place, so the question for her became how long will she give it? Although she isn't counting what she first did to start testing the idea. Uh, I think I'm in the thick of that right now. <laughs> okay. How long have you been doing yeah, this? Yeah, I had been working on the business plan for about two years and then incorporated in December of 2015. Really? So in December of 2015, we st I had started the business with by just doing pop-up events. Okay. And so for the first year we did pop-up events, I got a small studio that I shared with a couple of other women furniture people, and then uh, until I could find the bigger space to realize the bigger business model. So February of this year is when we moved in to our creative studio and started building it out, and we grand opened in May of this year. So just this year? Yeah. All right. So we kind of I've phased the business model, which is not what I thought I would do in the beginning, but ended up being really smart because I could start to build a community and interested people and a little bit of revenue stream before investing in this larger space. So did you quit your other job for two years during yes. that time, and yeah. you sustained yeah. it by pop ups and and, and and marketing consulting, marketing consulting, mostly. Right. Yep. I think a lot of times when people especially in creative business owners, I think you're doing five different things at once, mm -hmm. especially in the beginning until you can really make one of them fly. 
So in terms of like how long I'm going to give it, <laughs> I've got three years on a lease here. Okay. I've got a loan now that we have to be able to pay back. And so that's probably in my time frame of how we'll make it a go. I didn't realize it was that short of a time yeah. period. So, yeah. okay. Kyle is also still in the process of giving himself a timeline to succeed at Pieces Unimagined, but he did need to expand to the store next to him. We're still in that process. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. All right. We're very successful in that we employ people and we pay a very good wage. That, right off the bat, is a big accomplishment. And we have a good clientele that is consistent, that's broad-based from commercial to small, you know, little one-up, one-offs. And so we're on a good trajectory. So we opened up that store first. Okay. And then we outgrew it like in like three to four months and knew we needed another one. So, you know, needed more space. So we decided to come over here. So populating it has taken a year. We populated that one and we populated this one. So that's, that's kind of part of the growth uh, process, giving people selection and having merchandise um, that they can choose from. And one of the things we kept suffering that was setting us back is that we would get a good load in, it would be absolutely awesome, and then a weekend would come and we'd get wiped out. And so we were like constantly, you know, stressed. You know, every week was a different stress. Yeah. And we finally have this equilibrium where even if we have a great weekend, great week, we're not scrambling anymore. So that takes a while to be able to get to that point. So your problem was is that you were too successful, you're saying? The problem was we were too successful. (laughs) Must be hard. And so it was adding a lot of stress to everybody, you know, because we'd all be scrambling and some artists would get stressed. And um, another portion of what we do, a big portion, like 40% of what we do is custom. Mm -hmm. And so people look at this table and they're like, I like it, but... Mm -hmm. And then we take care of the book. (laughs) What used to be in this side before you expanded into it? A ivy-covered brick. There was no windows here. It wasn't anything. Why did you decide to call this a separate name? There was supposed to be two particularly different businesses. Okay. Uh, Unfortunately, because of that, you know, immediate success that we were having, quote unquote. Yeah. I never was able to delineate the two properly, you Mm -hmm. know, so... We're set to be able to delineate them in the future, but not not yet. You okay. know, we have a website for interior statement, but that just directs you back over to uh, pieces on a mansion. Mm-hmm. I, it's it's resourcing. You know, we need somebody to actually take that on, and I'm probably not that guy. <laughs> you got enough to do. I'm, <laughs> You've laid the groundwork. I do. Leah's timeline was based on the lease that she signed when she opened Booth 121 which is one way to just have a means to an end. That way you don't feel the pressure if you think about it. We signed a three-year lease, so it was, that's what it was. And I guess I never really had that in my mind uh-huh. that we weren't going to. This business is versatile enough where we could have changed things up. We could have, if the consignment part wasn't working, the option was we could take a loan and buy more wholesale. We had that option there, but we didn't want to do it if we didn't have to. We were going to make it work. I guess there was, was no, like, if option. I don't do no, this in no. three years type of thing. Okay. No, there was no timeline. There was no option. For the quarterly concept of Confectionique, how did Anastasia come up with the timeline? So she used the concept of profit to determine if this outlet she had was just a hobby or something she could keep on doing. We decided that um, I think... Uh, we had to become a profitable business. I mean, we had, even if it was $5 profit, right. we had to become a profitable business. And because then it, the whole thing is, well, then is this a hobby or is this a business? And for me, I really wanted it to be a business that I could continue going to Paris, shopping, bringing goods back, being able to update where I wanted to and that kind of thing. So for us and for me specifically i wanted to see growth every year so we look to make sure that we have growth in our customers that attend our our events that we are reaching financial goals to keep going and have a very solvent business that kind of thing i i think is important if if you truly want to be a financial success i guess and Mm -hmm. i'm not even from 
business industry. Um, I was wondering if you had a background. Uh, you know, you're from the social. So you just I'm a social worker. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, that's my trade. Okay. So no, but my husband's been incredibly helpful with helping me make sure that that the business is staying solvent. And after each market, you pay your bills, and then you decide you budget what you're going to spend for the next time that you open, and then you try to put some money away. That's kind of how we do it. And you learn by doing as well. I mean, you can sit there and go, this is how the business plan is going to be, which is smart. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't mean that it's like, well, then everything's going to go perfectly. That's not how it works. We've had to adjust our business plan over the years. And there are times that I'll think of, I have got the most phenomenal idea in the whole world. Let's implement it. And then it totally tanks. It's just not what people come here for. And so then I have to just kind of always think, okay, what is the mission statement? What are the goals of the business? Which is, we are a French-themed market. People come here to find unique, beautiful things at a reasonable price, and they look forward to the themes, and they look forward. It's like a community gathering. It's like I have a party eight times a year right. that people come for. And so whenever I step away from that goal is when I run into trouble. So it's just best for me to stick with what I love, what I know, and what customers enjoy. I was very intrigued by that particular model. For most of the people I'm talking to, it seems like the timelines are kind of a passing thought, like failure was not an option type of situation. Even John from Mother Fools, who was going into a field that he admits he knew nothing about, didn't have a backup plan, which just seems so crazy, I would think. No, I didn't really think about it that way, nor did I think about anything really long-term. I... I wanted to get it profitable as fast as possible, um, but I didn't really have a timeline. Uh, One joke that we made a lot in those days is if either of us had a business degree, we would have shut this down a long time ago. Um, Yeah, because the numbers weren't positive. It took a long time to build a a clientele. Okay. But, you know, I think some of that was just this blind faith and projection. Uh, We really worked a lot on our marketing Mm -hmm. during those years, and we had shows every Friday and Saturday. You know, we put out a live at Mother Fool's CD which really helped establish us, I think, as you know, just a little above the rest of the cafe music scene, which was pretty vibrant at that time in Madison. Yeah, we just full steam ahead and we pushed on it. And I will say, I do remember that it was attached to the indie music scene at the time. When you say that CD, I remember those. As a matter of fact, I think other places started doing that because you guys did this. For the Hatch Art House, Tammy said it was never really about a timeline. She thinks she would just try to find a way to continue, even if it does fail. Did you give yourself a timeline? I, I didn't, no. I, okay. I just wanted to do it, try it, and I was, it just, I felt like it would work. And I knew I didn't have to make a ton of money to make it work, to, or to live off of. Success is different for every single person. And I'm definitely not a wealthy person now, or <laughs> never, I've never, <laughs> I've always had work hard for my money, but... It, that's not what it's about for me. Mm-hmm. And so for success, I think that's an ongoing process. Like I feel successful when an artist sells something. Mm-hmm. It's it's giving me goosebumps right now. Like I, mm-hmm. it, it just feels really good. So, and that is a big drive behind me. Starting the art gallery was just the need and want to make artists, and most of them are emerging or fresh artists or were at one point, mm-hmm. and just to be like, you know what, you just sold like three paintings, mm-hmm. and you're, you just keep keep going, keep painting, you're doing great, and just be like that, that voice of encouragement for them, and to prove to them that they can make it. The Bohemian Bobble started as a shop, and Tammy, this Tammy, not the previous Tammy, that's pretty funny, I, know, I didn't realize before that I spoke with two Tammies. Anyway, the store for Bohemian Bobble ended after a certain timeline, but she kept going on with the pop-ups. When I got the shop, it was a total fluke. I kind of had always looked at that little building because it was right down the street from my house, and I had yeah. always thought, oh, it'd be such a cute studio or just such a cute space to have shows at. Yeah. And then one day, a for rent sign went up, and I was like, I'm just going to call and see what's going on. I was the first one to look at it, and I, I was like, yeah, I'm going to, I want it. And at that point, I think I only had a three-month or a six-month lease because the landlord was super cool with me. She understood that I had another job, and I was not planning on this, so I I pretty much opened up on a shoestring budget. And then I would just reassess. Every time the lease would come back up, I'd be like, yeah, let's keep going, let's keep going, let's keep going. (laughs) 
<laughs> nice. With the layoff, I didn't really set a time frame for myself with that either. I just thought I'm just going to see how it goes, and it kept being okay. You didn't okay. even think that far ahead. No. Okay. I mean, I did, but but it sounds like you're kind of a roll with it, and if I something am. needs to happen, then I'll deal with it. Yeah, I, I kind of I'm I'm kind of big on taking risks. I can appreciate that. <laughs> For the most part, I was surprised with the answers I got for this question. And the more I thought about it, they really were doing it anyway. And if this version did fail, I don't think anybody would really stop. Felt like the unspoken answer was kind of, I'll do it until I can't. Next week, I try to find out more about the places that they all chose. I want to thank you for listening, and if you haven't already, subscribe to the show by going to AmericanBandito.com slash subscribe, or you can find it on Google Play and Apple Podcasts. The music for the show is by Romcom. You can hear more of the music at AmericanBandito.com slash music. Next week, check back to learn more about these Madison creatives and what they do. Until then, so long. So long.